Alright guys, I'm here in the lab and I'm super excited to teach you guys about Chapter 9's coverage of elimination reactions. Chapter 9, Chapter 9, it is so fine. Woo! Elimination reactions are really almost an extension of Chapter 8 subject of substitution reactions. And I think you'll see what I'm talking about uh, as we get into it. Before that though, I want to show you an example of an elimination reaction being used in the literature. I found a publication from 1998. Okay, I know that's kind of old, but you know, it featured an elimination, so I thought it would be kind of cool, in which some researchers from Japan synthesized molecule one, which looks kind of hairy, but then by treating it with certain conditions, they were able to convert this carbon-carbon single bond right here into a carbon-carbon double bond. That reaction is actually an elimination. The way they did this is by, by converting this substituted selenium appendage into a good leaving group and then doing an elimination reaction. Elimination reactions are reactions in which a leaving group is pushed off and in its place is formed a double bond. Now incidentally, they took molecule 2 on over a couple of steps and made this thing called entelotoxin, which is a marine bacterial metabolite that kills goldfish. I'm honestly not sure why they wanted to do that. I assume it was because they wanted to study why goldfish had been dying. Or maybe they just wanted to come up with an expensive way of killing goldfish. <clears throat> so after today's lecture, you guys should be able to know the mechanisms of E1 and E2 reactions if given starting materials and conditions determine whether a reaction will be E1 or E2. Predict the major products of E1 and E2 reactions, including EZ stereochemical outcomes and carbocation rearrangements. Predict elimination products for reactions that involve substituted cyclohexanes. If given starting materials and conditions, predict whether a reaction will favor SN1, SN2, E1, or E2. And use substitution and elimination reactions in synthesis. Now please note we will skip section 9.7 from our text. Please also note that each of these different topics I've outlined uh, are discussed in our text in the sections that are written here. So as we discussed in our last series of lectures from chapter 8, Substitution reactions look like this. There's some kind of leaving group, in this example a bromine, which takes off and then gets replaced by a nucleophile, in this case a hydroxide. Thus we can say that the OH has taken the place of or substituted itself for the bromine. Now in contrast, elimination reactions look like this. We have the same kind of molecule, but if the hydroxide does not take the place of the bromide, but instead attacks a hydrogen on the carbon next door to the bromide and then pushes these electrons down like a trap door to form a carbon-carbon double bond kicking off the bromide in the process to form an alkene. This is an elimination. Now, I realize it looks pretty complex but don't worry I'm going to break it down step by step shortly. You'll notice though that in comparing the product alkene to the starting material that has this bromine, the product lacks the hydrogen and the bromine atoms that were present in the starting material. Thus, we could say that the hydrogen and the bromine have been removed or eliminated from the starting material going from left to right. And that's why we call this an elimination reaction. So similar to the way we saw there are two different kinds of substitution reactions, there are two different kinds of elimination reactions, E1 and E2. I'm going to show you the mechanism for each, and I require you, my students, to memorize them. Here's the mechanism for the E1 reaction. What occurs is you have some type of material that has a leaving group, which I've marked LG here. It's typically a group that is stable holding a negative charge, often a halogen like bromine, chlorine, or iodine. What occurs is the leaving group takes off and gives me a carbocation intermediate. This is the slow or rate determining step. What then happens is a base comes in, attacks the hydrogen on the carbon adjacent to the positively charged carbon center, forms a bond with it, and then thrusts these electrons down like a door on a hinge to form an alkene. This is the E1 reaction mechanism. Please note once again that the slow or rate determining step is forming the carbocation intermediate. Here is the mechanism of the E2 reaction. So just as in an E1 reaction, we have some type of molecule that has a leaving group on it. Once again, some type of group that can generally handle a negative charge, often a halogen like a chlorine, bromine, or iodine. 
but it could be something else as well. What occurs in an E2 reaction is the leaving group does not take off and leave a carbocation intermediate, but a very strong base comes in and in a single step grabs the hydrogen on the adjacent carbon, forms a bond with it, thrusts these electrons down to close like a door on a hinge, forming a carbon-carbon double bond, and kicks off the leaving group, all in a single step, ba-bam, giving me my product alkene. At the surface, E1 and E2 reactions both give us the same product. However, the mechanisms are very, very different. Furthermore, you'll discover in some nuances that I'll discuss later on that there are many occasions in which they actually give us different products. Please note that the slow or rate determining step for an E2 reaction happens to also be the only step, which is just this step, where the base grabs a proton, thrusts the electrons down to form a carbon-carbon double bond, and kicks off the leaving group all in one fell swoop. Ba-bam! So elimination reactions usually favor the most stable or most substituted alkene, which you'll recognize from our previous chapter follows Zaitsev's rule. In this example, I could imagine this base, methoxide, grabbing a hydrogen here and thrusting its electrons down to form a carbon-carbon double bond to the left of the bromine, or doing the same thing with the hydrogen to the right, forming a carbon-carbon double bond to the right. As it turns out, this actually does occur and, give, and gives me two products. Which product is the more favorable one? Well, of course, it's the one that has the carbon-carbon double bond in the middle, because that carbon-carbon double bond has more non-hydrogen substituents on it. And as you'll remember by Zaitsev's rule, the more substituted alkene is the more stable. Parenthetically, I should mention, that when you do an elimination reaction, generally speaking, you will get a mixture of both E and Z products, but generally speaking, the E isomer is usually favored because it's more stable. But don't worry, we'll discuss that later on. <laughs> Here's another example. You can imagine water acting like a base and grabbing either the hydrogen to the right of this chlorine to form a carbon-carbon double bond out here, or the hydrogen to the left forming a carbon-carbon double bond internally. While both products are indeed formed, the one that's the major product is the more substituted internal alkene because it is the more substituted alkene according to Zaitsev's rule. Now elimination reactions also usually favor the alkene that has the bulkiest groups on opposite sides. As I mentioned earlier, typically the E alkene. So here's an example where my base only has one proton that it can possibly eliminate, the one located on the carbon to the left of the bromine. As this base comes and strips that proton, thrusts the electrons down to form a carbon-carbon double bond at this position, and kicks off the bromide, there are two different potential isomers that I could form. The E isomer, shown here, or the Z isomer, shown here. Which of the two do you think is going to be more stable? Well, of course it's going to be the E isomer, where the two largest groups are on opposite sides of the double bond. <laughs> I never get tired of that joke. And the reason, of course, is because it's more stable to have the bulkier groups as far away from each other as possible. There are, of course, exceptions. If you have a circumstance when only one hydrogen is attached to the beta carbon, then the major product of the E2 reaction depends on the structure. Let me show you this example. Here's my leaving group, this bromine. If th in this particular molecule, you'll notice that the carbon next door only has one hydrogen on it right here. Now, as it turns out, the only way you can do an E2 reaction is if this hydrogen is momentarily trans and in the same plane as this leaving group. Now, because of that fact, when this base comes in, strips that hydrogen, and thrusts the electrons down to kick off the bromide, I end up putting the two methyl groups on the same side of each other, giving me the E product. According to what I said in the previous slide, that's what we would think would be the most stable and favored product. Ah, but what if I have an example like this one? In this case, I've got the opposite stereo configuration on this leftmost carbon. The only way my base can eliminate this hydrogen that's on the carbon adjacent to my leaving group bromine is when the hydrogen and the bromine are trans to each other in the alkane and are in the same plane. Thus, when this elimination occurs, because there are no other options, the two higher priority groups, this C6H5 group and this methyl group, end up on the same side as each other, giving us the Z alkene. So please note, once again, that in E2 reactions, where the carbon adjacent to the leaving group only has one hydrogen on it, 
There are occasions in which the Z isomer is the only isomer that you can form, as dictated by stereochemistry. Okay, so up to this point, I've shown you the mechanism for E1 and E2 reactions. You might be asking yourself then, how in the world can I distinguish between which one of those reactions is going to proceed? Well, don't worry. I pledge to tell you that in my next lecture video. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.